Good morning. It's nice to see you this morning. Out of this bright light, I can... The pews are almost full. No, I'm kidding. No, it is nice to see you. It is, isn't it great to get together with fellow believers? You know, uh, we, can, we can praise our Father, our God, our Savior as one, you know, and, um, and then we can hear from him this morning. We can, we can talk with one another, lift each other up. You know, it's just, it's so good. God knew what he was doing when he said, you know, don't forsake the gathering of the saints, you know. Uh, so I'm not surprised to, that God knows what he's doing because <laughs> he is wonderful, isn't he? So why don't we sing, you know, about the king of our heart this morning? Why don't you, uh, if you uh, can stand, join us, let's praise him together. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the mountain where I oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, oh. Good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, oh, you are good, good, oh. Be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my. Sorry about that, but <clears throat> anyway, thanks for hanging in there with us.
hand number is it? What what hymn number was that? Oh, it's one fifty seven. All right, one fifty seven. We'll be able to follow this one. Be able to sing with us this time. On a hill far away, smoothing no rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross with the dearest and best, for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross exchange it someday for a crown in the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty i see for it was on that old cross jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown To the old rugged cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Amen. Well, why don't we pray? <laughs> Father God, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you, Father, for that old rugged cross. I want to thank you, Father, that you paid the price for each and every one of us. Before we even knew you, Father, you knew us. You knew what we needed, and you provided a way. And we just give you the thanks and praise this morning. Father, we just want to lift up those who can't be with us this morning. We just pray that you uh, give them peace and comfort those who are sick, we, you just lift them up to health, Father. We thank you. Thank you for all you do, Father. Thank you that we can always come to you, that you're always with us. Our hope um, is always in you, Father. So we, uh, we just want to lift you up this morning and praise you. 
We want to hear from you this morning, Father God. Open our hearts and our minds to what you would have to say to us. We thank you for it all. And we ask this through our Lord Jesus. Amen. So I don't know, uh, you won't be able to sing, so if you want to just sit and why don't we just listen to the words and if some of the songs, you, I mean, if you know it, please sing with us. What can I give to you? What can I offer to a king for all the love you shown? For all your mercy over me. I called your name, you heard my cry out of the grave. And into life, my soul is free, my soul is free. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. The rock of salvation. My hope is built on nothing less Morning by morning How great is your faithfulness I called your name You heard my cry Out of the grave and into light my heart is yours my soul is free thank you god for saving me thank you god for saving me thank you god for saving me for saving for all you made a way Jesus in victory you rose you made us all your own now we are saved you gave your life upon the cross you suffered once for all you made a way Jesus in victory you rose, you made us all your own, now we are saved. Thank you God for saving me, thank you God for saving me, thank you God for saving me, for saving me. cry out of the grave and into life my heart is yours my soul is free thank you god for saving me thank you god for saving me thank you god for saving me for saving me. Amen.
faces, I'm not just speaking to a camera. So uh, the other day, me and Jenny went to pick up a couch that somebody had posted on uh, Marketplace on Facebook. And we went and we picked this couch up and we ended up talking to these people for two hours. We didn't know these people, but I think people are so starved for communication and interaction because of the pandemic. Uh, it was just nice to be able to talk to people. And so I appreciate seeing you guys here. It's great to uh, be able to fellowship. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for you who are watching online who can't be here with us. Uh, thanks for joining us online. If this is your first time here, we have Get Connected cards in the pews. Uh, you can fill one of those out, and we'd love to reach out to you, get to know you a little bit better. If you're watching online, you can go to the church website, which is cfcscotland.org. Click on the contact page and then you can send a message to the church office and we would love to uh, get to know you a little bit better, figure out a way you can get plugged in here. Ladies, if you got a bad Dunkin' Donuts gift card, we have some replacements, so you can either speak to Mindy, I think there might be some out in the, the ushers have some, so talk to an usher, say, hey, I got a bad gift card and they'll give you a new one that actually works. Junior Church, Emily is still looking for help for Junior Church. If you have a gift with working with kids and you'd like to get plugged in that way, talk to Emily and help out with that ministry. CFC Library. We have a great library over here. I don't know if you guys have ever visited it, but uh, there's thousands of books in there. Now, Janet, who does a good job keeping that up, is asking if you have a book that, you know, it's been sitting on your table, you've been using it as a, you know, something to put your coffee on, or you know that thing that's like prop your door open, Bring that back to the library so somebody else can use it to put their coffee on. <laughs> share, share those books. So bring those back if you've had a book for a long... If you're still reading it, well, then just hold on to it and read it. Uh, this past week, we sent $1,000 to Honduras. This upcoming week, we're going to be sending uh, $5,000 to Samaritans first to, to their Kenya ministry. And that can be done because of your faithfulness. So uh, Samaritans Purse is a great ministry. Uh, the reason I love Samaritan's Purse is because they're gospel-focused. Whatever they do, they preach the word. They preach the gospel. They make sure the gospel, if they're drilling a well, they make sure somehow those people hear the gospel. So we are going to send 5000 this week to them, so we thank you for your faithfulness. Continue to pray for those who have had surgeries this week. Karen got a new kidney. Uh, Janet had surgery on her neck. Doug got a new knee. I know Doug, I texted him that night, and he said he was already walking on it. So the, the technology is incredible these days, but continue to pray for them. I know through recovery there's pain involved, and so pray that God would give them comfort as they recover. Uh, we were going to have a missions moment, but I don't think the technology is working. So we're not going to do the missions moment. At this point, we're going to have Lori come up and uh, do special music for us. After Lori, kids, you can go to junior church.
Thank you, Lori. This is that awkward moment where everybody just looks at the guys moving the pulpits forward. Thank you, gentlemen. Today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. going to be looking at verses 10 through 14. I had the privilege of going on that trip to Bolivia in 2008. You know, the cool thing about being part of a local church is that we give and we're able to touch different parts of the globe, even though we're not able to go there all the time and be part of those ministries all the time. But through our giving and our, our generosity, we can see the gospel being spread throughout the whole world uh, through the ministry of the local church. And so we get to play a part in what's going on around the world. Uh, and that's just a cool thing to think about. I was watching that video and seeing all those kids being impacted by the word of God. Knowing that we play a part in that is, uh, is a cool thing to think about. Philippians chapter 3 starting with verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord God, we just pray that you would help us to apply what we learned today to our lives in a real practical way. And that's our desire. Speak to us today through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. So last Sunday we looked at how believers have the ability to rejoice in every and any situation uh, despite the circumstances we may be in. Why is this? Well, it's based on the fact that uh, we've been saved through grace and faith alone. There's nothing we can do in and of ourselves to be saved. That's through grace and faith alone. In verses 8 through 9 from last week, Paul says this, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. This truth reminds us that we're going to have moments in life where we fail. Uh, we're going to have moments in life where we mess up. But our salvation is not based on that. Our salvation is based on the moment we place our faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And at that moment, our eternity rests in the hands of God. Our eternity is secure in the hands of God. Now, if you're born again and you have that truth, then that's something to rejoice about. That's something to rejoice about. Paul then goes on to say that this faith relationship that he has in Christ based on the grace of God, has given his life a new purpose, a new goal. In verses 10 through 11, he says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death. You see, the first part of Paul's goal is relational. Now, if you have social media, you'll see these memes put out relationship goals. I don't know if you guys have ever seen some of those memes Usually it's a picture of a, a guy hunting with his wife. They're in a tree stand together, and the guy will post this, and he'll say relationship goals. Or it'll be a guy with his wife on a fishing boat, and they're pulling in bass, and it'll say relationship goals. The ladies usually post a man in an apron decorating cookies with her, and she'll put relationship goals. Paul says, my relationship goal is to know Christ deeper to know him better and better and better. This word to know in the Greek means to know 
by experience. What does that mean to know by experience? In English, we have one word to know, and that's to know. In Spanish, I love Spanish language, they have actually two words for to know. You can know how to do something, like you can know how to tie your shoe. You can know the answer to two plus two. That word is saber, to know how to do something. But when it comes to knowing a person or a place, it's a more relationship type of know, and they use the verb conocer. It means to know by experience. So if someone asks me in Spanish, hey, do you know Harford? Well, if I've been to Harford and I've lived in Harford, I've experienced Harford, then I conocer, I know by experience Harford. Paul says here that he wants to know Christ experientially. It's more than just this knowledge, this head knowledge of Christ. It's an experience with Jesus Christ. The idea he's trying to paint here is, I want to know Christ better today than I did yesterday, and I want to know Christ better tomorrow than I did today. It's a, a life of living in relation with the Lord. We see this idea played out in the life of Enoch. In Genesis chapter 5, we read this. Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. So we see this idea of knowing God by this walk, this faithful walk with Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen two young people begin to date or, or court? When I was a kid, they, they'd say, going out. Are you going out with that person? I can remember when me and Jenny began to take interest in each other. I don't know if you know this, but we're high school sweethearts, and she was the scorekeeper for the soccer team. And I can remember I was the goalie. I played goalie, and I'd look over at the score table, and I'd say, hmm, I think I want to get to know her a little bit better. And we ended up sitting together on the bus, and we ended up chatting and getting to know each other. Well, those, those bus ride chats weren't enough. And so I got her number, and we started talking to each other on the phone. And, you know, I, I grew up in the, the time of dial-up internet. You remember that? You know, you couldn't be on the phone and have internet at the same time. And so I would hear my parents yell from downstairs, get off the phone, we need to use the internet. I wanted to get to know Jenny, I wanted to spend time with her, I wanted to communicate with her. And that was my heart's desire. Those long phone calls turned into dates on weekends, and it didn't take long for people to say that we were connected at the hips. You know, it, it's all my time, all my free time I wanted to spend with her. I wanted to get to know her. At this point in the relationship, your friends start getting annoyed with you. You know, they start making plans on the weekend. They say, oh, wh what about Tim? Oh, forget Tim. He's going to be spending his weekend with Jenny. He's, he's a lost cause. Why? It's because I wanted to get to know her. I cared for her. I desired that relationship with her. Paul says, I want to know Jesus like that. I want to know my Savior like that. That's my relationship goal, is to know Christ fully and deeply. The scholar Hendrickson says that this phrase, that I may know him, refers to a knowledge not only of the mind, but also of the heart. It is a deep yearning for a relationship with someone that goes beyond just intellectual knowledge. It's a heart knowledge. It's a knowledge that knits two people together. We see the same Greek word used to know, and it was used by Jesus in John chapter 17. Listen to this from verses 1 through 3. This is a prayer that Jesus actually prayed for his disciples. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, experientially know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that you know the Father, that you experience Jesus Christ, that you become knit together 
with him. Do you realize that it's God's desire as well that we have a relationship with him? It's God's desire that we get to know him better. There have been seasons in my life that I, have, I haven't always done that. Uh, there's been seasons in my life where I've chased after other things and have left Jesus Christ out of it. We all have seasons like that where we pursue things of the, the flesh and the world and we just, we don't desire that deep, close relationship with the Lord. We're not nurturing it. And we end up paying the price of feeling empty and spiritually bankrupt. I read a story of a rich man who was determined to give his mother a birthday present that would outshine all others. He read of a bird that had a vocabulary of 4,000 words, could speak in numerous languages, and sing all 12 of the Beatles albums word for word. When he discovered this bird, he immediately brought it for $50,000 and had it sent to his mother. He was so excited, the next day he couldn't help. He called his mother up and he said, Mom, Mom, did you get the gift? Did you get my bird? She simply responded, yes, and it was absolutely delicious. How often do we pursue what we think is that perfect relationship? How often do we pursue that thing where we think this is it, this is, this is it, and we leave Christ out of it and it just ends up leaving us empty? spiritually bankrupt. We pursue what we think is perfect, but if we leave the Lord out of it, man, it usually ends up like this bird. Just, it ends up swallowed. To know Christ, that is our most important relationship in life. To know Christ more. Everything, every other relationship needs to be a distant second after this relationship. To know Christ to know him more and more and more. That should be our relationship goal. When speaking to the Galatians, Paul once again uses this word to know. He says in chapter 4, Formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? whose slaves you want to be once more. So check this out. Paul says that once we know God, once we experience God relationally, we are then known by God. The relational circle is complete. We become part of the church. You know what the church of Scripture is called? The bride of Christ. I like that term bride because it's a, a marriage relationship. We don't have a greater term in the English language for a close-knit relationship than marriage. The Bible says that once we enter this relationship with Christ, we're married to him. It's the ultimate picture of unity, a unification. It's the strongest picture we have between unity and love between two people. Marriage. The Bible calls Jesus our bridegroom, and we're his bride. Do you know that has always been God's desire for us to know him? God has always wanted to have a relationship with his people. Listen to what he said to the people through Moses in Deuteronomy 6. Now, this passage is called the Shema. Jewish people today still pray this twice a day in the morning, in evenings. This word Shema means to not only know, but obey. Not only hear, but obey. Listen to this passage from chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. You see the relationship talk there? Love, loving God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your soul. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I think sometimes when we read this passage, as parents, we, we tend to focus on the do part of it. Oh, I need to talk about this when, with my kids when I'm at home and we're sitting down, when I'm doing this and doing that. We need to constantly be talking about Jesus Christ. And that's true, we should. But we forget the love part. The love part is the most important thing. 
when we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength, naturally we're going to talk about him. You ever see somebody who, who loves something, what do they talk about? Uh, if they're talking about fishing all the time, you know they love fishing. If they're talking about the Red Sox all the time, you're thinking, man, this guy really loves baseball. We naturally talk about the things we love. When we love God, we are going to naturally want to talk about him. Someone may ask, well, how do we experience this knowledge of God? How does this take place? I mean, the, the people in the Old Testament, they got to experience it by walking through the Red Sea. They got to see the miracles. They got to experience God on the mountain. How do we experience God today? Look at verse 10 again. Paul says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, and they share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I think it's important that we understand what Paul says here when he says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Do you know that this word power in the Greek is the word dynamis, which is where we get our English word dynamite from? The way we experience Christ in the power comes from being born again. You see, those, those examples of power that the Israelites saw in the wilderness, those were external experiences. The Bible says that when we become born again, when we ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior, we get indwelt with the power of God. Those ex external experiences that they experienced in the wilderness, we get internally. We get the dynamis, the dynamite of God internally. You can't get a better experience than that. We get Christ living within us. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus says this, but you will receive power, again, that word dynamis, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, when we receive the power, the dynamis, we experience God. And what does Jesus say? We're going to be what? His witnesses. We're naturally going to want to talk about him. Remember in John 3 when Nicodemus asked Jesus what he needed to do to be saved? He says, Nicodemus... You need to be born again. And Nicodemus, he gets confused. He's thinking in terms of the flesh. And Jesus says, no, you need to be born spiritually. It's not a physical re rebirth. It's a spiritual rebirth. The resurrection power that Paul is referring to here takes place when we are born again. We go from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. In Ezekiel chapter 36, the prophet, speaking of future times, he says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and keep my laws. Paul's greatest relationship goal was to know Christ experientially, to know him more and more to experience the power through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and to live a life of sacrifice for his Savior. The last part of verse 10 here says that I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. You see, Paul was so focused on knowing Christ experientially that he wanted his life to be a perfect reflection of his Savior's. He wanted to live the way Christ lived. He wanted to sacrifice the way Christ's sacrifice. His desire was that his life would look like, like his Savior Jesus' life. That's what he wanted. That's what he wanted to model. He was trying to live out Luke chapter 9, verse 23, which says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. I like that. It's taken up our cross when? Daily. It's a, a daily uh, experience. We're constantly trying to get to know more and more. We're constantly trying to live for Christ better and better every day. This was Paul's desire. It was his heart's desire to know Christ. That should be our greatest relational goal, is to know Christ more and more. I love verse 12 because Paul's getting into the practicality of now. How do we do this? How do we live this out? How do we get to know Christ more? How do we uh, increase in our relationship with him? In verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold 
of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You see, here we see Paul's humility. He's saying, yeah, this is my desire, but I'm, I'm not quite there yet. Uh, I've made mistakes. I'm still struggling along. I'm still working at this. I'm still pursuing it. I'm still striving towards this goal. The first step in our relationship with Jesus is to know that as long as we're still in the flesh, perfection needs to be pursued. So check this out. We know that we will never be perfect in this broken, sinful body of ours, but we're to live and strive for as we can be. We're to, to move forward as though we can be. We pursue perfection as if it is attainable. I can remember as a kid, uh, I would have a dish day. I hated doing dishes. But that was one of my, my chores. I had to do dishes. It seemed like whenever it was my day, my mother would burn something and it would get crusted on the bottom of the pan. You ever try to wash a dish where something's crusted on the bottom of the pan? I'm sure my, my sisters probably thought the, you know, thought the same thing when it was their day. And so I was a kid and I would you know, scrub it down a little bit, try to scrape the food off, and then I would just throw it in the strainer. Well, my dad would walk by and he'd see it and he'd throw it back in the sink and he'd say to me, listen, if you tried your best and you didn't get it off, fine. But I know this isn't trying your best. We need to try our best. We may never attain perfection, but we're to live and try as if though we can. That's the way Paul lived. He says, I know I'm not going to attain perfection, but I'm going to strive for it as if I can. Paul knew he wasn't perfect, but he pursued it like an athlete running for a prize. The picture painted here in our passage is that of a Roman athlete running in a coliseum. Now, I don't know if you've ever run competitively, but if you want to win, there are certain things that you you must do. And one of them is you run with with your eyes ahead. You don't uh, run looking behind you. Paul says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. If you're going to have a successful running, you can't focus on what's behind you. I was watching this video the other day, and uh, this guy was running down the, the street, and he seen a pretty girl. And he looked over, and he ran right into a pole. You're never going to succeed in life if you keep looking behind you when you're running. Paul says, I run to know Christ as an athlete running to pursue a prize. We need to forget what is behind us and strive ahead. Dr. Warren Rivesby wrote, Do not say, why were the former days better than these? You do not move ahead by constantly looking in the rearview mirror. The past is a rudder to guide you, not an anchor to drag you. We must learn from the past, but not live in the past. You see, we all have junk in our past. We've all made mistakes. We've all messed up. Paul, he was a persecutor of the church. Uh, He stood by as one of the, the early church evangelists was stoned. He dragged Christians off to be beaten and thrown in prison. In his ambition to be religious, he flogged and beat believers. Uh, Paul had junk in his past. In Luke 9, 62, Jesus says this, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. We strive ahead. We focus on what's in front of us. One man said to his friend, What's wrong? You sure look depressed. The man says, Well, I'm thinking about my future. He says, you're thinking about your future? Well, what makes it look so hopeless? The friend replied, my past. My past. Living in past failures will cripple you. Living in past success will lull you into inactivity. Let me say that again. Living in past failures will cripple you. Living in past success will lull you into inactivity. Inactivity. I love the picture of this phrase, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. In the Greek, this phrase, straining toward, paints a picture of a runner who's, who's all stretched out. He's, his ligaments, his muscles are all tight as he's striving in the race. I ran track in high school. I ran the 100-meter dash. Now, if you know anything about track, the 100-meter dash is a race that lasts about 10, 11 seconds. And from the moment that gun gets fired, I mean, you are given 110%. 
you are striving, striving, striving. And if you ever watch the Olympics, you see when they get to that finish line, what do they do? They literally throw their bodies across the finish line and they're all stretched out trying to attain that goal. Paul says, my relationship goal is to experientially know my Savior like never before. And I'm striving for it like that runner attaining that finish line. I'm all stretched out. I'm given 110%. I'm pursuing it with everything I have. The author of Hebrews writes this in chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Spurgeon said, by perseverance, the snail reached the ark. And we may not be the most qualified in the race. We might not be the fastest. We might have junk in our past. But what do we do? We throw off the sin that's entangling us. We fix our eyes on Jesus. And we persevere. We persevere. That's what Paul says. I'm going to persevere and do my best and keep my eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. That's my relationship goal. President Calvin Coolidge, who was named after the great reformer, John Calvin once said this, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan press on has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. You see, the greatest relationship goal that we should have as believers is uh, to seek after our relationship with Christ with uh, this tenacity, this determination. If the snail could reach the ark, uh, we can grow and reach maturity in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, how do we do this? How do we do this well? Number one, we simply approach it being humble. We simply approach it with humility. I'm going to try my best and depend upon Jesus Christ to grow and mature in my relationship with him. Secondly, we don't live in the past. We've all got junk. We don't focus on the past. We learn from it, and we strive ahead, focusing on Jesus. And lastly, we do it by being persistent. Don't give up. We're going to have those bad days. We're going to have those days that, that get us down, where we're feeling beaten up. Determine and be persistent to grow and seek after Christ. The enemy's out to get us. He's going to throw all kinds of things in the way. Be persistent to know and love Jesus more and more. I can guarantee that it will all be worth it when we're standing before Jesus Christ one day after we run this race called life. And if we're determined to grow, one day he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come and enter your father's rest and enter your Father's rest. That should be our relationship goal, to know Christ more and more and more and to pursue that with determination. I pray that's our goal as we move ahead in our relationship with the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have ultimate truth, real truth, truth that can help us to live in this world, this world that can be so often confusing and uh, broken Lord God, our desire should be to love you more and more. Lord God, you demonstrated your love towards us in this by giving your son Jesus Christ. And so it's only natural for us to return that love by living for you, by seeking your face, uh, by drawing close to you. And so I pray that you would give us that heart, that you would give us that passion, that you would make our lives a perfect reflection of yours as best we know how. Lord God, we thank you for Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And it's his name we do pray. Amen. 183. Ooh. Sorry. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. A day I will never forget After I'd wandered in darkness away Jesus, my Savior, I met Oh, what a tender compassion
compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a Savior I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in the mansion sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed. Riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down. 